All right, let's start the experiment. Um, uh, this one is the enzyme uh, kinetics experiment, uh, enzyme kinetics of popping. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the background and how the experiment is done, and also talk a little bit about the uh, the background on Miguel Menten uh, kinetics, as well as the um, uh, line weaver Brock plot, um, and also use of Beer's law. So let's start. So now, um, let's see. So again, uh, each you know cover starting page. Uh, we have some focal point. Um, so you know, if I mention something like you know kinetics, oops, uh, if I mention like something like uh, you know Michaelis Menten kinetics, um, oops, I don't know why it, this is doing this. Um, Michaelis Menten kinetics. Now I can write. Okay, good. Um, and then uh, line weaver Brock plot. Uh, use of Beer's law. You might actually you know take a look you know at the slide and make it, maybe take notes. I'm going to make this as easy as possible for you to take notes. Just like last time, I'm going to uh, add a half of the screen being updated so that um, so that you can you know, hopefully not stopping the video and take notes. All right, so let's see. So popane is the um, is a it's an it's one of the enzymes just like uh, chemotrypsin. It's uh, has been extensively studied. Um, I got uh, uh, the structure from Protein Data Bank, and um, the how it shapes is not that important. But you can see the uh, you know catalytic pocket here, and it's a cysteine enzyme uh, instead of serine enzyme. So the actual mechanism itself is pretty similar to um, to uh, chemotrypsin. But anyways, so uh, let's look at the um, actual reaction. So it's this particular enzyme, papain, has been extensively studied. It's a protease, uh, just like chemotrypsin, uh, but it actually uh, it cleaves a certain substituents. But in the, for our case, we are instead of using a protein to cleave the peptide linkage, we are actually using the model substrate called BAPNA. Um, the, um, the structure of the BAPNA is not that important, but you know, except for one location where you see right here, you see the amide linkage right here. And you can think of this as the, the point where it gets cleaved for hydrolysis, just like peptide. Peptide linkage is an amide linkage on an alpha carbon, um, uh, or next to alpha carbon. Sorry about that. But the peptide linkage, uh, so it's you know it, this resembles somewhat is the you know the peptide linkage. So and because of the presence of the um, 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 the you know substituent here uh, in this case, you know this particular uh, functional group. And uh, it, you know, it fits into a catalytic pocket. It gets cleaved just like uh, chemotrypsin does, uh, except that again, the papain is a cysteine protease. So instead of OH group for the active site, it has SH group. But anyways, so um, so what it what does it do is the real question. So let me erase that. So again, what it does it's the hydrolysis. So you look at H two O here, and then so it hydrolyzes. Oh, by the way, my camera. Is right here, but my screen for you know writing is actually down here. So I'm I'm gonna kind of go. I, I try to put up stuff up here and down here. So I might actually my, you know I you know eyesight might just go you know left and right. But anyways, hopefully you know it won't bother you. But anyways, so going on, uh, continue. Uh, let's see. So uh, what it does, it's um it's the um the uh, it's a uh, it it. It facilitates the, uh, it catalyzes the hydrolysis reaction. Hydrolysis meaning that you add water on this particular linkage right here, right? So it cleaves right here in the amide linkage. And then, you know, water, you know, you can see OH group. And then again, hydrogen here. So you have H2O being added on the each, you know, terminal group. So it makes it amine and carboxylic acid. So um, because of that, right? Uh, it cleaves right here, and then you have p nitrile aniline as a product. p nitrile aniline is a um, is a pretty uh, good compound for detection purpose because uh, you can see NO2 is you know it's it has double bond, and you have a single bond, double bond, single bond, double bond, and then you have you know, get double bond, single bond here in NO2. So it's a highly conjugated system. So it has an intense yellow for the uh, for the and as a product, and then because it's a yellow color, uh, which means you know you it has a color, which means light is being absorbed, 
right? This case particular wavelength is about 400 nanometers. So, you know, so which means right around the UV, you know, visible, you know, threshold range, um, you know, it absorbs light. So which means, you know, if it absorbs light, if the product absorbs light, and then we can do spectroscopy. You, you can, we can use UV with spectrometer to detect absorption. And if it absorbs, then we can actually use time-dependent study. So as the product is being formed, the absorbance would go up because more p nitro aniline being produced, higher the absorption it is. And if you look at the actual rate of reaction, then you can actually tell the velocity of how much the p nitro aniline is being produced. So as time passes by, so you're looking at this, um, as time passes by, absorbance goes up. Eventually, you'll probably it's, it can it could go up straight, it could go up continuously, or it could taper out at a certain point where it basically is no more absorbance right being detected. So this range, chances are, you know, either the you know the reaction you know completed. Uh, so it basically, if it doesn't change, so this range right here, it pretty much reached the equilibrium, right? So we're going to look at the range, this range right here, where the response is linear. Let me actually write this down slightly better so that uh, you can probably see this a little bit easier. So here we go. So, um, so you're looking at this range, right, where the re response is linear. And then, uh, so this part right here, remember, it's where the, you know, you know, where the reaction reached the equilibrium. So we, there's no point of doing time-independent analysis. But we could use where the linear response part is right here, right? Because if you have a linear response, we can just use y is equal to mx plus b to get the reaction velocity. In this case, absorbance uh, over time. But of course, in absorbance over time is not that convenient. So we have to convert this into concentration versus time. But for the time being, you know, we're going to use the Beer's law. But, you know, just wanted to give you some heads up. If you're... Um, Absorbance is greater than two. That range is probably not usable because the way absorbance is calculated is basically it's a minus log of percent transmittance in fraction. So basically, two means almost 100% light is being absorbed, right? So you want to work in the range where it's less than 1.5, and 1.5 is probably about 90% of the light is being absorbed, but still 10% is coming out to the detector. So detector could still see some light. Then you can actually use the you know the range where instrument can actually detect the, uh, the actual light coming out. So keep that in mind. If you have you know the uh, the concentration that is greater than like 1.5, chances are it's pretty concentrated. You're not absorbance is too high, which means percent transmittance pretty low, which means not much light is coming out to the detector. I mean, the, the, not much light is being detected. Right or you know, you know it being seen by the detector. So keep that in mind. Now, so, right, so let's see what can we do. So we have absorbance versus time, and we have the linear range. So remember that we have you know, uh, you know, changing in concentration over time, right? I use the you know term that dc over dt because you know I use calculus, so you know it's, that's how I typically show dc over dt. C means concent means concentration over time t. Uh, but you know, for your case, you're you know, you are uh, using probably Excel to get the linear fit, anyways. So if that's the case, you know, changing in you know, concentration over a certain time range would be good enough. So in this case, you have a you know linear range. So in this case, linear range, right? And you look at the concentration um, over time. So um, so if you look at um, the linear response. Um, you can actually convert uh, this, you know, to um, concentration over time because um, absorbance is not that um, uh, convenient uh, because there's no unit there. So if you want to use DC over DT, you want to convert it. You can use Beer's law, right? So uh, how do we do it is the real question. Um, so let's see. Uh, so anyways, so, you know, how do we convert uh, Beer's law, if you remember from uh, from analytical chemistry, uh, you know, absorbance is equal to EBC, right? So E being molar extinction coefficient, B is a path length, in this case, one centimeter, and C is a concentration. So um, 
So if you solve for C, then concentration is equal to in absorbance over EB. B is a path length, it's a one centimeter, and this one centimeter unit gets canceled out with molar extinction coefficient, excuse me. So at the end, you know, you are actually just, you know, doing A over EB. So if you have Excel spreadsheet, then uh, you have a time, you know, so you have time range and you have absorbance, and that's what you originally have as a raw data, but then, you know, you can just use, you know, B2 over EB, and you can just, you know, set you know, the, the uh, path length as one and E as in molar extinction coefficient, which is in the uh, handout anyways. So you can actually convert and you can just use, um, so you can just use uh, control um, plus D to fill down. You can just go down and just fill all the cells and you can just do uh, time versus concentration and you can plot these columns to get the linear plot. So if you have that, then you plot now concentration. Uh, if you do concentration versus time, so and you have you know this range, so you can calculate you know initial velocity and you know so time is you know again dt. This range right here is the dc. So keep that in mind. But of course you know if you are you know you are doing initial rate. Uh, but wherever the linear range, you know, linear response takes place, uh, that would be fine. Um, but notice that, you know, remember that the, the fastest velocity would be where the substrate concentration is being the highest, which means, you know, you want to do initial velocity because, you know, as time passes by, the slope gets, you know, slower and slower. So, you know, at any given point, your slope, you know, as slope goes, you know, slope changes, you know, I'm just doing drastically, but you know, eventually slope kind of tapers out as concentration, you know, as time passes by because you don't have as much substrate in the system. So, you know, as long as you have, you know, you're, you know, you'll probably want to do in the beginning range from t from zero, t from zero through you know, maybe first 10 seconds or even less. So keep that in mind. You're doing initial velocity. So in that range now. Also, another important part is that, you know, your sampling rate. So when you actually set the um, instrument parameter, you want to make sure you don't want to uh, acquire data for four minutes. Uh, I think the instruction right now calls for four minutes, uh, maybe one minute. But in reality, you're really using about only the first 10 seconds. But your sampling rate has to be, you know, multiple sampling per second so that you have enough data points. So maybe minimum uh, every 0.2 second, or possibly if the instrument allows it, every 0.1 second you want to actually acquire data so that for 10 second data acquisition, you have about 100 point, 50 to 100 points to make the uh, uh, the uh, curve fitting or linear regression. So keep that in mind. Now, so, um, so you have substrate concentration assay one, right? And then you get your velocity. So you get your, you know, DC over DT for one, and the assay two, which has higher concentration, so your you know velocity will be inherent and faster. And then assay concentration three would be even higher initial velocity. So and if you do that multiple times, each one would give you velocity, right? So keep that in mind. Initial initial substrate concentration. That each point, all right, uh, is what you are using uh, to you know plot substrate versus you know velocity. That, um, Michaelis Menton curve because more substrate concentration you have. So you have you know, substrate concentration this, right? And then you have velocity, substrate concentra concentration this, and this much velocity, substrate concentration that, and more, you know, this velocity, substrate concentration this, this velocity. And that's what you're doing here, 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 and here. So keep that in mind. Now, but going back, um, but, um, but the Michaelis Menten uh, plot, saturation plot is not convenient because you know, unless you have a sophisticated curve fitting program, um, which you may have, but you know, for the most part, um, you know, it's hard to actually find the actual Vmax and Km value. So you want to use double reciprocal plot, also known as line weaver Brock plot. So you take, you know, double reciprocals, which means one over V. So you have instead of V turns into one over V, and then you have substrate, 
instead of substrate, you have one over substrate. Uh, so keep that in mind now. And then you plot. Um, so once you do that, and then, you know, you can get B max and KM. Uh, of course, you know, B max is pretty straightforward because, you know, it's Y is equal to MX plus B. So B to V max, you just take a double one over B to give you, you know, the actual, you know, could be, you know, V max. That part is easy enough. Now, one over KM, remember that KM, right? Remember KM is a, a negative value. So keep that in mind, this KM, it's negative, right? Because it's negative one over substrate. It's a negative axis right here, right? So in order, so once you do one over one over KM, you have to also do minus of that. And so again, this will X, X intercept, and then this will be a positive, right? Remember, this will give you positive KM value, right? So the negative of the negative KM. So otherwise, um, you know, if you just take inverse of this, your KM is going to be negative. We don't want that because what's the definition of a KM? KM, right? So it's one over, you know, you know, it's one over two V max, right? So half V max is here, KM is here. Definition of KM is the KM is the concentration that gives you half V max, right? Again, definition, the, the concentration that gives you half substrate concentration that gives you half V max, right? So the, the unit for KM is what? The concentration. The concentration, you cannot have negative concentration. So when you calculate KM, if it has negative value, you did something wrong. The common mistake, you forgot to you know, minus that. So keep that in mind. Now that's it. What do we do? Uh, each group will receive pH um, of uh, assigned pH. So ranging from pH 5.88 through uh, 7.88. Uh, you're going to work on a particular pH. Other groups will work on other pHs. And they will you know, gather uh, the, the what pH works the best. Um, but in meanwhile, uh, you're going to you know, plot a uh, line weaver bark plot. Uh, so, but to, to do that, you have to plot absorbance versus time first. And then you're going to convert this into a concentration versus time. And then you can get you know, a line weaver bark plot. And then, you know, and then you calculate your KM and Vmax. Everybody will report your Vmax uh, value. And then you can tell me, uh, or tell Dr. De, uh, well, you can tell me, or tell your instructor, um, which um, which pH uh, works the best? Uh, again, we have to gather group data, but the group data will you know will announce what pH worked the best for this particular year. Um, again, every year you know depending on whether pH is, is, is actually set. Um, hopefully, this pH is adjusted uh, is right on the dot. We'll see the, the temperature affects the pH, so uh, so we'll see which pH it would work the best this year. But again. Remember, it's a cysteine protease, right? So which means SH has to be, the cysteines in a substituent SH has to be protonated. In order for the SH group to be protonated, it has to be in the certain pH, remember that. So, uh, so just virtue of knowing that, you know, actually, you know, the, the protonation of SH group, you can tell what kind of pH would work better than, you know, other pHs. Anyways, that's it. Just something to think about because you probably have to analyze that when you analyze the optimal pH. But anyways, so that is all for today. Um, uh, thank you for watching and I will we'll see you uh, next week or so. All right.